All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Scott McGuire. I'm the president of the Mountain Lab. We're the organization that collaborates with Outdoor Retailer to put on the venture out space out in the back of Pavilion 2. If you haven't been out to the pavilions, please make a point of going out, check it out. A lot of people don't realize that a third of the brands that are here at Outdoor Retailer are actually outside in the pavilions, and it's worth going out there to discover what's new. Our panel today, we've brought together four other people. What we want to do is we want to talk about the way brands connect with their audience. And there's a challenge there. There's 1,500 different brands that are in this space at Outdoor Retailer. There's probably 5,000 brands in total that are going out trying to reach your customers every single day through a retail channel. And that's going this game of telephone, right? 5,000 unique messages that everybody wants to tell. They want all those retail kids to understand that message and they want to understand what you're doing and they get 30 seconds to do it. So how do you do that? How do you take a brand message that's real and authentic and is honors what the brand stands for and get that message to carry all the way down to a sound bite that's going to come out in 10 seconds as to why this brand exists. Uh, so we're going to talk with a group of people. So this is Devin. Devin O'Shea is co-founder of Fayette Chill. It's an organization out of uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, new retailer and manufacturer of product, uh, very much in the lifestyle space and traditional outdoor. I'll let Devin talk more about his brand. Dr. Rob, Rob Bingham here is a PhD in analytical science who decided that he would get into the retail space and apply what he had learned in the science world around understanding behavior and the way, the way things interact and look at those systems and apply the knowledge of those systems and the study of those systems to the way that retailers and brands communicate with each other and start a training program called Presentation Authority. Dan is the director of Schwood and co-founder of Schwood. If you guys aren't familiar with Schwood, it is a uh, brand that hand carves, hand creates wood creations, right now mostly seen in sunglasses. Uh, Dan has a long background though in this. He worked at Red Bull, put on a five-year event tour, that engaged with college campuses, living in a van, as you said, five <laughs> months out of the year, talking to people and actually telling those brand stories. And then on the end is Bob. Bob is the founder of Arbor. Arbor's uh, now going into its 21st year as a skate and snowboard brand that's presenting here for the second time after a five-year gap out of outdoor retail, talking about why a skate and a snowboard brand wants to engage with outdoor customer and how maybe psychologically we've thought of skate and snow separate from outdoor, but really over the last three decades, four decades, they've been a lot more coherent than we've thought and that consumer wants to hear that message. Sound good? So if you guys don't mind, we'll just start. Each of you take a couple minutes to talk about your companies, your brands, and the things that you do, and then we'll get into some questions. Cool, so uh, I'm Devin O'Day. What I do primarily is direct the media and marketing for our company. We are a experience-inspired outdoor company. We sponsor a number of athletes, rock climbers, mountain bikers, fly fishers, basically everything that will stoke people up, get them psyched to go outdoors, and um, connect people together by generating community based off those passions that they're demonstrating. Uh, the main way that I do that is try to capture those moments when people are ex as excited as possible, uh, living life to the fullest and uh, really expressing their passions uh, both to themselves, uh, to their loved ones, uh, through social media and all that kind of stuff and through the community. And uh, my favorite thing to do with it is to generate really uh, evoking, inspiring videos that encapsulate our message, which is we're Fayetteville. Our thing is go outside relax for a little bit, if you relax, the things that inspire you will pop up, you'll attach to those things, you'll find other people that are attaching to those things, and community will develop from there. Um, I've seen this message work for a lot of people, I've seen the spark of, what I call the spark of life, um, wake up inside people's eyes when they engage with it, and it's, uh, I, I love my job because of it. Rob? Cool, uh, I'm Rob Bingham, and thanks Scott for that great introduction. Uh, so I'm from PresentationAuthority.com and basically I have a background in retail and what we're seeing in the outdoor industry is everybody's talking about is that there's a, a new consumer, there's a new generation of people who are getting outside. And what I saw on the retail end of it was that there was a, a lack of communication that was really getting these great brand stories and brand messages all the way out to the retail sales floor. Uh, a lot of time and money is spent developing these great stories, messages, and ideas, but as it filters down, it tends to get diluted. And so the customer really doesn't ever understand really what a brand is all about. You know, Fayetteo, great stories, Schwood, great stories, Arbor. But if the customer never really gets it, if they never hear it and they never understand it, it's a real missed opportunity. And we have a big opportunity coming up because this new consumer is going to be a huge chunk of the retail market. So 
Um, I started Presentation Authority basically to help train people and companies um, to deliver those messages in a better way. Um, from the very physical stance, the, the human element of it, um, all the way through to kind of conceptual ideas about how best to reach this new audience. And um, it's, it's really pretty fantastic and I'm excited to be here and uh, looking forward to questions from the audience. I'm Dan Jenko, I'm with Schwood Eyewear. Our whole mission is to inspire curiosity through the use of natural materials. So we felt eyewear was a little flat, so we wanted to think outside the box and how we did things. Came out with wood, we've done stone, we've done newspaper, recently with Atlantic Records. So for us, it's, it's about really trying to get the consumer to think outside the box of what they can have, how to engage, and have that story to tell. So the biggest thing we talk to our sales team and to in the stores is like, how can you tell the story? What, what tools can we arm you with to really engage with that customer and connect them on a whole nother level? And then socially, we try to do things to also help connect and get people outside, go explore, find places that you wouldn't normally think with close to your city, close to your home that can really help you experience things in a whole nother world, which we're super passionate about. I'm Bob Carlson with the Arbor Collective. Uh, 20 years ago, we started a snowboard and skate brand. I think in the larger sense, Arbor is about life lived outside in the pursuit of snowboarding, skateboarding, and surfing. Um, on, a, a, on a smaller sense, but very much at the core of our brand, it's about how we make what we make. Um, we've been focused on sustainability since day one. In our first catalog 20 years ago, we, we talked about sustainability. Um, and aspects of craftsmanship and collaborations with artists that help tell what in the end is a, is a sophisticated story. And I think for us, the, the challenge over the years is how do you tell the, the deeper aspects of story in your brand through the marketing channels that we have? And as new media has come into play, uh, that has been a, a, a big part of what we do. And you know, the challenges there and the limitations there and the opportunities there are, are understanding those is a big part of our success and communicating complex stories through those new channels is a difficult task and I think it's I think it's why this subject is so important. So I think that's why I'm here today. So nice to meet you guys. Cool. <laughs> Quick uh, survey of the audience. How many people in the audience are in retail? Okay. How many of you guys are with brands? And what percentage is media? Small percentage of media. Good. So what we'd like to do at the end is I would like retailers to walk out of here with a thought, you know, if you guys have paper, notes, type it on your phone, whatever, I hope you're just taking your phone because we're not boring you and you're actually taking notes, um, is that you guys walk out of here with some ideas in your head. These are some things we could go back to our shop, to our online site, when we could actually utilize to improve our storytelling. And the same with brands. If you're a brand person, you're thinking about telling these stories, how are you going to go ahead and, and what, you know, if everyone leaves here with two or three ideas that are going to help them go back and maybe try something a little different in their store or in their brand, that would be, that's the end goal. That's what we're targeting for. There are no right answers. I don't think that if anyone says, this is exactly how you have to communicate with your audience, that doesn't work. That's not realistic because the audience changes constantly. Everyone that walks in your door, everyone that engages with your brand is coming from their own unique point of difference. So they're not going to walk in and be able to say, oh, like, I've heard a little bit, or they might have heard a misnomer about your brand or about your store. So they come with their own different assumptions. So th there's no perfect way to do it. I think what we need to do is be as creative as possible. Technology has definitely tipped things on its head. You know, 10 years ago, it was easy. You came out with an ad campaign, you did your POP, you had your tech reps and your sales reps go in and educate the floor staff, and you had your sales. And that worked. Nowadays, it doesn't really work that easy. There's a lot more democratization to it reviews coming from people that have used your products can completely overwhelm your traditional marketing campaign. So you might say you've got amazing quality and you've got two stars on your website because of your quality. Ad campaigns and marketing doesn't work. That end consumer has a lot more influence and power. So how we engage and bring them into our community is going to be much more important as we go forward. I think that power is going to become greater and greater and greater, not less. So we, I think what I would like to see us do as an industry is make sure we engage those people more and engage different people. Um, I always joke putting on Venture Out, which someone referred to as Hipster Hollow the other day. Uh, <coughs> well deserved. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a dirtbag outdoor guy from way back and someone took a shot at me when we first started Venture Out that it was nothing but hipsters in their selvage denim. I'd like to say that I put on my very first pair of selvage denim in my entire life today. This, uh, <laughs> there's a lot to learn from different communities. You know, if you're in SUP from earlier, it's not a bad idea to go over and talk to the people in climbing and say, hey, how did you guys do this? 
there's a lot more that we can learn from each other, people that maybe aren't the same than just looking at what your competitor next to you is doing. They're like, oh, well, so-and-so did this in our space, so we should try the same thing. So we'll try and get some differentiation. Um, Dan, I'm gonna start off with you with a question, if you don't mind. You were, as you were talking over, you were talking about your background you know, with Red Bull and living in the van. When you were out having the, in it, right, five months on the road, telling brand stories, putting on an event, engaging with people, what did you see people coming up asking you in that one-to-one -one experience? I mean, for us, it was about shaking things up, just doing something totally outside well, Can you the tell box. us about the event as well? So yeah, so we looked at a college campus as being pretty non-eventful, right? You have your comedians, you have your concerts, and that's really what's going on. We had a passion for the outdoors. We wanted to do something to really draw people's uh, attention, shock them, you know, really grab them. So we trucked 30 tons of snow into the center of a college campus in the middle of the spring or like right before finals, right in May. And we'd build this huge rail jam, you know, four stories high, 30 tons of snow and bring in about 60 athletes that we'd recruit. And we'd basically take over the center of a campus with this viral event that would really draw people in. And so we actually worked with, with brands like Arbor and other great uh, snowboard brands in the industry to throw this event. And a lot of the times it was brands were coming and just popping up a tent and just trying to talk to the students, right? Well, that's not really engaging them. So some of the challenges with my partners, like Ford was a major partner, like is they, they didn't know how to think outside the box. It was like, let's do these little small things to help interact and help engage them, get, draw them in to be able to talk about the product and be able to maybe create a lifelong experience for them. They're not gonna buy a car you know, at a rail jam, but they're gonna experience how they interact with that company, what they think about it, that could impression them for the rest of their lives. It brings up an where you said how they interact with that company. There's a, it seems to me that nowadays the consumer is much more cognizant of how they feel about that brand and how they associate with that brand. You know, we've talked about sustainability and other things, right. but there's a much more, I think the consumer day has a much more emotive need to connect with who they're talking to. Bob, you and I have known each other literally since either one of us was in this industry. I can understand the Arbor story because I've had 20 plus years of hearing it. I know you guys are doing videos and telling stories, but how does someone that's, you know, they're walking up to your booth today and they're saying, you've got, you got 60 seconds, tell me why Arbor is different. How do you build that emotional connection that pre time, or do you even try? Do you just try and hint and let them go discover? What's the, what's the way that someone goes about that? I, I mean, I think for us, we've, we've always let product, our product be the entry, entry point. Um, and we, we try to hit on some of the key points, and, and, and then yes, we, we hope people will discover the brand from there. Because to try to get, try to put a, a brand story like ours into two or three bullet points is it's almost impossible. So you gotta pick your battles, you gotta know your audience. I mean for us, and, and I think this goes across all media channels and all channels that we, we have access to, the results very, very rarely come close to the size of the market. Uh, I'll use, let's use traditional media. Trans World Snowboarding, I think Max has something like 80,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, there's something north of a million snowboarders in the United States. So with a big ad campaign, you're touching less than 10% of the market. Um, when you put out a, a video and you have success in some endemic success, maybe you're getting 25,000 views. Um, so why do that? If you're not really, if you're spending a lot of money and you're not really hitting a lot of people, I mean, for us, it's been about the opinion makers. And you gotta hope that you're, you're touching people who are moving your message down the pipelines. And you, if, if we worried about the volume of people we were, we were reaching with a lot of the media out there, both new media and old media, we would not, we would have a hard time finding a return on investment. But in the end, when, if you can get your head around the concept of opinion makers and be willing to speak to opinion makers and trust that they will spread your message and actually define your message for opinion makers, give them the tools they need to pass it on, uh, you can have some success. But it's, it's still tough. You look at, you look at the numbers in, in the channels. And frankly, when you do hit a home run, and we've had a couple of videos go north of a million, we have one video that's been north of two million, you never know, did you just get part of your story out to the market, to the right market? Did the two million people that watched that downhill skate video that we produce, are they actually the market? Or are they just consumers of media? Does that bring people to the retail stores and create sales? It's hard to say. So for us, the sanity comes from knowing that we're touching, or touching as best we can 
opinion makers and trying to give them something to tell their friends about. Um, honestly, for the retailers out there, our best opportunity to reach the most amount of our market is through you guys. So we, have, we focus on, on training and trying to work with telling the best nuggets of our brand to the shop, to shop kids and hoping that they will, at the retail store, be able to pass that on. Because that today, today, that's still the best way to reach the most, the largest segment of your market. So training for us, old, some of those old fashioned clinics and training and getting in stores and connecting with our retail partners is how we get our stories told, so. It's a interesting, you know, Rob, when you and I first met, we were talking about yeah. clinics and the, the mindset of playing the stump the rep game and yeah. having staff on the floor that oftentimes is more knowledgeable than the person was coming in trying to give the clinic. Where do you yeah. see that, I mean, I mean, I've been in that experience where you see a shop kid that knows more about the brand and what's going on and yeah. even the specs. How do you see brands doing a good job of that? Where are there some pitfalls where they've done better? Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, of all the companies I've talked to, very few of them actually train their representatives to, uh, to properly tell this story. They're always pretty good with specifications. Not always, unfortunately, but a lot of times. They're pretty good with product specs. They can spout off weight and use and all that, but they don't talk about the experience much. And they don't do it in an engaging way. They're flat, they're boring. And so what I see on the retail side of it is that retail staff doesn't get interested. They, they just don't care about the brand. They don't care about the products. Maybe it's a good product, but if they're not excited about it, they don't use it. And if they don't use it, then they don't have their own user-generated stories that they can share with the consumer, with the customer, who's right there in front of them, and honestly is pretty open to influence. Um, a lot of the customers that, that are shopping are just looking for something, but they don't know what. So to have sales staff that can properly tell them what's right for them and what's exciting for them adds a lot of value to your product. And so there's definitely a disconnect. Companies aren't putting enough investment in their employees to be able to tell the stories. And that just doesn't trickle down to getting the consumer excited about it. And you know, as, as Bob was saying, user-generated content is huge. The, you know, this new generation of consumer is very digitally linked in, and they're very social, they're very connected to everyone else. It's a huge opportunity for companies to um, use those people, use their customers to actually market for them. Um, there's a recent study, user-generated content was uh, seen to be about 20% more influential than traditional media in influencing a purchase, and it was about 35% more memorable than traditional media. That's a huge opportunity for companies to be able to excite people about it. And to do that, they really have to excite all of their employees throughout the company and all the way to the retail side. It's interesting, when you guys applied to come in to venture out, it was right about the same time I think you'd launched your new brand video and it's, there's no words in the video. There's no real talking about it, just fade chill and there's this box that shows up at all these different spaces. And how did you guys get the point? It was untraditional because it doesn't say, hey, we're Fayette Chill, this is what we do, who's here we are. You just showed it through imagery where it seems like the person that would engage with you could see themselves in each of those spaces. Was that thought, like, here's oh, why yeah, we're that, that was very purposeful. Uh, we wanted that video, Fayette Chill in America, to be a demonstration of all the passion, or all the things that we're passionate about. We uh, cover a wide array of different types of athletics, so we wanted to show our products going from the store or our smokehouse where the video starts and going to all these beautiful scenic spots throughout Arkansas and the Ozarks, uh, the region that we represent. And we wanted people to feel that spark of opening up that product box, putting it on and engaging with the things that we represent. One of our taglines is we're experience inspired apparel. Um, so we wanted to show those experiences that you have with those uh, pieces of apparel. We put it, we are very about uh, layered culture. So we put a very engaging song to it. They kind of had, you know, put the feels into the, to the video. So uh, we've seen that video do a lot for us. When people ask, you know, to that question of how do you communicate what your brand is in 60 seconds or less, all I need is five seconds to give a hyperlink and then people know what to do with that. Yeah, so uh, videos do a lot for us. Uh, pictures say uh, worth a thousand words. Videos are a thousand pictures. So it's pretty. Sure there's a outdoor insight yesterday. Bob brought by a magazine, and they did a ranking of social media influence for all the different brands. And they had Arbor was at the top for influence on YouTube. And there's the numbers of YouTube views were arguably up there with some of the largest brands. You know, the the billionaire brands here. It's tough. You cannot go forward today as a brand and not be a production company. We often 
think about the center of the effort at Arbor as a production company. It, it consumes us. What, what, what projects are in the pipeline? What, what messages are important? How are we, what filmers are we going to work with? You know, what's, and it's ever changing, the, you know, the ideas of, of what's effective as far as length, um, words, no words, music, how to use music, music rights. Um, I never, I started Arbor to make snowboards and skateboards. Today, I, we're in, in many ways a, a production company. Um, I know more about making movies than I ever thought I would. Uh, but that's the, that's the nature of it. And it's, it's a fun and very powerful media. Um, and uh, it's a great way to tell your stories. Um, it, I, I, like I said, it, I, I often wonder though, the, how valuable some of those views are because they reach beyond my customer. You know, that there are people consuming my media that are not gonna buy a skateboard or buy a snowboard. Maybe they'll buy some apparel from us, I, but it's a question mark. We're gonna keep doing it because we know we are reaching that really important slice of opinion makers in our market. And if it goes beyond that, um, you know, it can't hurt. Digital's not always the silver bullet, though. It's Definitely really, not. I think about Eric being in the booth, like, I could probably watch a video of Eric making an ax, right. but being there and watching him talk about the craftsmanship of wood with wood tools in his hands, do you guys take that experience on the road? So it's, it's not just a, a video and a hyperlink, but a place where someone walks and like, why are you at this event? I mean, someone walked through venture out yesterday, and like, there's a guy whittling over there. And being able to actually explain the craftsmanship that goes into your product. What does that look like as a, I mean, do you do that as an activation at a retail store? Yeah, and that, that's a big thing for us is our process and we make it here in the US, so it's like how can we show and help that consumer connect with us, help the retailer connect and help the consumer connect. And then there's like 40 something hand steps in making a pair of sunglasses. And we like to show that through our, through our videos, very process driven, showing exactly what we do to when we go on the road with trade shows to meet retailers, we'll either make a skate tech or an ax or you know, something like that to show the hand movement and show the tools and show that we are craftsmen. I mean, we've, we've been at a show and they're like, oh, did you just hire that guy? I was like, no, that's a creative founder. He actually hand carved the first pair out of a tree branch in his backyard. He's now making an ax that you could win. You know, just to kind of show the quality and the attention to detail that we have. We'll do clinics where we'll come in and our guys come in with a full tool belt and they lay everything out and they show you all the different grades of wood and what it is with the sandpaper and all the little details that we use to hand finish this pair while your store reps are holding the pair of sunglasses and feeling the quality and showing you like, here's how it went from, you know, 40 grit to 80 grit, you know, all these different levels of smoothness to detail it out. And then talking to the customer, to the store about, here's how you relay that to the customer. You talk about how high quality is, how lightweight and comfortable it is on their face because it is seriously hand, hand done to fit comfortably for them. So you give them maybe a couple key bullet points that they can reference, but they're going to remember that experience of how they touched and felt the product and had their own hands involved. And the biggest thing we hear, even from anybody who comes to Portland and tours our facility, is they're like, wow, we've seen your videos and we saw your presence, we think it's amazing. But coming here, it's like a whole nother world. And that's, that's our biggest challenge still, is how do we sh really connect and show our story through the process. We have a lot of great ideas coming out. It's just like, how do you really take the process? It's more than a product. The consumer today wants more than just a product. They want to buy into that brand. They want to really feel like they're part of that brand. They've connected with that brand. So the challenge is always like, how do you connect and engage with your consumer? So that's, that's what we try to do. You're talking about the, you know, it'd probably be hard to explain to someone the difference between an 80 grit and a 200 grit, but when you're you in a place it. and you're physically touching it, that gets yeah. away from Rob, you were talking about that yeah. flat. I mean, it's actually tactile, they feel that difference. Have you seen other brands that have done a really good job of that where they've, they've had tools that they've created to help create an engagement in their trainings? Yeah, it's surprising how infrequently uh, a lot of reps will actually have cutaways of their product so that they can actually show you what's inside an air, you know, a sleeping pad or what's inside a sleeping bag. They talk about that there's layers of insulation, but they don't actually show it. Um, visuals are a huge thing. Visuals and actually putting, like he said, product in people's hands and also free product. I mean, putting swag in people's hands. It makes a difference because there is that very personal connection to the product and it gives a great talking point for these demonstrations so that you can really see what they're, they're talking about, whether it's grit of sandpaper or a type of insulation. And really, to me, it's all about that human element that's part of these presentations and part of these products because as, as we talked about, it's not about the gear as much as it is about the culture of that gear and the culture of that company. If you don't have a culture around your brand, you're not gonna get a following. 
because people do want more than the gear. They, they want to identify with a brand that has values that are their own. And so bringing in tangible, touchable uh, examples and really having that human element to it, that human component, makes for a much stronger product presentation. I, I completely agree. Um, you can't create the kind of emotion for product or people uh, with videos. You can create some of it, but you know, having people come to visit your headquarters, getting out and meeting people and connecting with people personally is lasting. I, I, to this day, I still do over 100 clinics myself um, because there's, there's so much value in being able, to, for me, I think, to be able to still connecting with the, the, sh the kids in retail and hearing, what, hearing how they see Arbor, hearing what's important to them. It, it's so important for how we go forward. Um, it's, it's amazing, I, I, I get this, there's a, there's a, I want to say it's Merrill, but one of the old backpack guys years ago would go out and he would do fits and he did it for years. And there are guys out in, in a lot of the outdoor retailers that we work with uh, that still talk about him being out doing fit clinics on packs, you know, and that has affected their whole career. And here they are, they've been in retail for 40 years, they're lifers. And, and meeting that guy and connecting with him around the gear, around the experience, lasted with him to this day. There's very little that you can, that you can do to get a story across, like connecting with somebody face-to-face, one-on-one. And, and, and I think that human element is, is important. And that's why we, I myself try to lead by example and try to get our, our team out as often as possible, talking to our market, talking to our partners, and telling our story. You were talking about your smokehouse, and it's interesting. Uh, your headquarters is is open pretty, to the public. Yeah, it's open to the public, and it's you know it's a pretty modest building, but it's this classic building on one of the most iconic street corners in Venice. So it's yep. it's in the heart of culture. It's interesting, like with you know, I don't think a lot of people in the outdoor industry traditionally like, oh, you know, Fayetteville, Arkansas, like it's right there with Boulder and Portland. <laughs> but you guys are really proud of the place you're at and your, your physical space tries to manifest that. Oh yeah, so we're based in the Ozark Mountains and it's really this kind of hidden gem of an outdoor hub. Uh, mountain biking scene is just blowing up there because of all the rolling mountains. And we're based in a old abandoned uh, smokehouse that used to smoke meats and cheeses. It's a four story building, 30,000 square feet, and it just oozes with character in every inch of it. So. Uh, that's where we get a lot of our inspiration from. We have an outlet store that we uh, sell apparel through. And when people come there, they just really, they, they understand what we're at, about as a brand. In terms of that one-on-one -on -one experience of really driving home what the brand's about, we are always going for that, oh, I get it, moment. So we have, ham we have a hammock in our logo as our main thing. It's a dude that's relaxing in a hammock in a setting sun. And so when somebody, when we have a hammock set up at our smokehouse or at our store and somebody sits in it, they're suspended for a second, they relax, and they go, oh, I get it. When we hand them our apparel and they understand that it's as comfortable as it gets, because that's what we're going for, we want people to put our clothes on and think about what they want to do next, that experience they're about to have that's em embodied on the design of the shirt or the function of the product. We don't want them thinking about the strange fit or the itchy tag or anything. We want it to feel as comfortable as possible so their mind automatically goes to the next thing, which is that experience that we embody as a company. You know, we were talking earlier about specs and product. You guys are talking about this emotional connection with product. Reps sometimes are maybe just talking about the technical aspects. How much, Rob, from your experience in retail, how much do you think the culture of a brand, the way the brand presents itself, and I think we've looked at, we can look at brands like Patagonia and we can see that their sustainability message has done a lot for them, but have you seen brands, without naming them, right. that have, their product might be exceptional, but because there's such a disconnect culturally that no matter what product could be amazing, how much value is there in making sure that the, the corporate alignment, the cultural alignment is synergistic with the consumer? Yeah, the, unfortunately, the, I've seen it all too often where companies do a, a poor job of representing themselves in the retail sector. They actually, I, I've seen it where they've actually pissed off retail sales staff, like the entire staff, and that staff then will actively persuade customers to buy a different brand. <laughs> That's a huge loss for a company. So the human element is a really important one, but to nail it right is critical as well. You can't just be there. You have to be there and you have to do it well. And that's just about being excited about your products and your brand. And I mean, 
the leveraging social media is huge. So you have this human component, but then you have this digital component too. Um, for the new consumers that are out there, 60% of them are on Twitter daily. It's, a, it's such a platform to be able to get a message out, and hopefully that message is good. When it's bad, it's pretty bad for your company because the new consumers, they also really identify with authenticity. These companies need to be true to their core and they need to represent themselves accurately. And to reach this new segment of the population, which, I mean, it's gonna be the largest generation in American history, the millennial generation. You know, anybody born after 1980 has a, a different way of looking at outdoors. To be able to leverage them properly you really have to nail down your story and who your brand is because if you don't, they're going to turn off and they're going to share that, um, that dislike and distrust of your company for all of their friends. And you know, as Bob was saying, you know, it's great to be able to link into these kind of brand ambassadors. There's, there's social media magnets out there, there's, you know, just people who just have a huge following because their Instagram feed is awesome. You know, they do great stuff on Periscope. So they have thousands of followers. If you can get them to pitch your product because it's in line with their story, that's a huge, huge marketing advantage. And if unfortunately you irritate them or turn them off of your company, it has the direct opposite effect. So there are a lot of brands who do it well. They come in, they do clinics, and there's a lot of brands that unfortunately don't. And to survive, I think we really have to change how we approach but really from brand development and story development all the way to the retail sales floor. We have to approach that from kind of a holistic presentation perspective. Dan, does that resonate? Yo, definitely. So yeah. as, a, as a brand coming, you guys are five years? Six or, years. Okay. Where's that risk reward come in? Like, you know, hearing Rob, like you do it right, you're, you're golden, you do it wrong, people will actively discredit you. So how do you guys look at that and say, all right, like we, we, we feel good that we're doing it right. I mean, at some point that seems a little tenuous. Yeah, I mean, it's one of our four core values is authenticity. So it's really being true to ourselves and who we are. We turned down a lot of large opportunities in the beginning because we felt like we would actually disappoint maybe a big box retailer at the time by not being able to keep up with the production of the sunglasses. So for us, we really wanted to make something that is special and truly unique. And so we're authentic in our videos and who we are as people. What we do is a passion to show through our brand. When our reps go in, we're very selective as to who we, who we pick to be our representatives to go into retail. And the retailers that we work with, we don't open everybody up. We turn down more retailers at a trade show than we open because of the sheer fact like they really have to embody who we are. And, and if we have that partnership, it's truly going to be successful. If we don't have that real connection as a partnership, as humans, right, you're going to lose that relationship. So we have, a, we have a saying that high quality customer service never goes out of style, right? And that, that connects from the, the true customer to the retailer to the brand, right? And so for us, our customer service to each store we open is we're making a full-on commitment that we will be there for them no matter what. Connecting with them you know, every couple weeks, training them, being there, supporting them no matter what, they're getting that level of service and we expect that from that to the end consumer as well. So if you start off treating your retailer by more than just a transaction, they're gonna treat you more than a transaction and it carries forward all the way to the customer. Yeah, we, we hear it from almost all of our retailers like, the level of support that we offer for an eyewear brand is like next to none. So that, and that, for us, that means a lot. That's what we're about, is really being there to support, support them. And what's interesting for that too is that there is a study done where it showed that if you improve your customer relations by just 1%, your revenue basically improves by 2%. The more investment you put in your customer relations, the more that you can be seen as a company that's responsible and responsive, the better you're going to do because you're going to be able to get your product out there. It's a solid ROI. It, exactly. I mean, that's it. It's an, it's an easy sell. I want to make sure you have time for questions, but Bob, I'm curious, you know, going back to 1995, Bob, starting Harbor versus uh, 2015, are there things that you knew then that have proved out to be true now that you'd advise new brands? And are there things that back then, I mean, you mentioned you never thought you'd be as much of a, a production house, but is there anything that Back then, you're like, God, I wish someone would have told me that would have been the case. A ton, uh, there's a ton of stuff I wish I, you know, I tell people today. You know, go work for the biggest guy in the industry and learn because you, you can waste so much energy inventing systems that already exist and, and you can go out there and put yourself way ahead of the game if you learn. Uh, you know, and I, I, I spun my wheels for a long time learning how to do the basics because I didn't go work at a snowboard or a skateboard company. You know, having said that, um, there's a lot that I think we knew instinctually, maybe we couldn't put into words, um, and I think it has to do with 
knowing who you are and sticking to who you are. I, I, always, I like to say, you know, your first marketing decision is, is your name and you gotta, you gotta carry that authenticity all the way through what you do from every, everything we've talked about, from you know, the name, Arbor, Arbor's a Latin word for tree, we work with sustainable wood and, and everything we do, and the concept of tree and the, the individual nature of tree and the lines that, 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 is, that, that a tree represents. I can go into a lot of different things, but from your name to the people you hire, to your message, to your product, to your place, I think place is a huge part of branding. Your place should represent your brand um, and it should represent your ethos and it re should represent the people. Everything has to fall in line with what you are when you start, and you have to stick to that. It, there, it, people are so, people are attracted to authenticity more and more today. Ideas of aspirational, the aspirational brands where people are perfectly prepared and they, you know, their hair is perfect and their clothes are steamed and, you know, they're out there in the outside, but their clothes aren't dirty for some reason. That's not real. And it, it's, it's authenticity that is, is what people are attracted to, but they're also, quick to call you out when you're not being, being authentic. And you gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta, so you gotta stick to who you are. If you wanna change what you're doing, start another brand. Because that will kill your brand if you try to evolve beyond what you started and what you built. And for us, we've, we've just stuck to our guns. Today we're doing exactly what we said we were gonna do 20 years ago. I, I can't tell you that I knew that we had to do that in the beginning, but I think it's, for us, part of our stubbornness, pig-headedness, it got us there. Today, I'm sure that we got to stick to that original ethos, so. Cool. Well, looking at the other side, looking at you guys over here, you know, making some hand gestures, hopefully you guys got some notes. Did anyone get it, an idea or two to take home, or something they would do a little differently? We've got about 15 minutes. I want to open up if anyone has any questions or answers or uh, ideas that they'd like to share or things they'd ask the panel. Anyone? So the sure, I'll, I'll repeat back the question. So the question is whether or not we use interactive video in any of our brands or video in, in any of our brand promotions. De definitely. I mean, we've done a few different things where um, kind of using GPS coordinates, um, creating some sort of challenge. So the first thing we did was called Nest, where you know, it's about getting out. And so the founders of the company went out and built this tree house in the middle of the forest, in the middle of Mount Hood wilderness. And we just posted the GPS locations and said, come find it. There'll be something there waiting for you. And it's this awesome video on how to build it. We had the biggest response through our Instagram, social media, everybody coming, finding it. People traveling across the country to come find this place, posting on it, writing in the log. Then they would take the tree house, they'd build a, a bench and they'd build like another area to hang out. And so it inspired, it, built into this whole community that was drawn by just challenging them to like get out and do something. Um, we had another campaign where we, uh, it was called This is Oregon. The idea is like anything is within 90 minutes of where you live that you can get out and really truly resonate and just disconnect and rest. And so we posted all these beautiful locations um, that you could go out and explore. And we partnered with um, Julian who does Hip Camp right now. And um, basically, you could go to the website and you could do a 360 view of this, this entire location and then the customer could go out, also take their photo of the shot and that would be entered into a contest so then interact with us and invite it to the after party where we had the whole, everything on display with Julian's prints and the sayings. And, and so then yeah. that interaction is you're going back and creating those ambassadors who are then advocating for you and your, your, your marketing is expanding yeah. just by their own participation. You're not going out and buying more views. Marketing today is not buying ads and just putting things out there. Marketing today is truly engaging and connecting with your customer. And that's what we're about. I mean, I think that's what everybody up here is about is, is really telling that story. And so we always try to challenge like what's being done. How can we do it completely different? How can we really make you go, wow, I didn't expect that, right? And so that's what it's about for so us. So with the Nest, did you, where'd that inspiration come from? Did you it's, come up with that on your own or just? see it and copy it from somebody else. No, it's definitely authentic. You know, we, we go out and do projects all the time as a group and we're like, you know what, our our authenticity and our customer, who we are, really does probably embody these same things and want to go do it. So let's actually push them out there. Let's see if they'll go to a place in the middle of nowhere, not knowing, crossing logs over rivers and just getting lost, right? 
and see if they can go out and push the boundaries to find it. And because we were already camping, hiking, finding cool stuff, we share stuff all the time on like different areas. And it was like, let's see if our customer truly it does embody what we value. And and it, the response was phenomenal. You guys have a bit of like looking at your video and making sure that everyone it seems at least when you guys are showing your employees, they seem to embody that. Oh yeah, I, I, we haven't done the interactive video side of stuff yet. That's definitely on our radar and it's super cool and engaging. What I think we do with our videos is something like interactive culture. We show one face of the culture, say it's like a rock climbing video and it's not super extreme. It's got a real chill approach to it. Uh, it shows the lifestyle that's ingrained with it and a rock climber will find our brand through that video and they'll be like, okay, I get it. Uh, this is a different take on rock climbing. And then at the end, you'll see a bunch of different videos that are mountain biking, yoga, hiking, and show different faces of the same culture. And they click through those, and they'll start to watch those, and they'll understand the undercurrent of it all is this chill lifestyle that we're pushing forward. And through showing those different types of faces of the, the company, even though it's completely different sports, they understand what we are as a brand, and then they understand that we like to connect the community together, even though these are disparate sports, they still have this connection and what we believe is that that chill approach to the outdoors. Cool. I think what's interesting about that too is that we you know none of us are talking about like these hardcore competitive athletes. We're talking about people who are just getting outside and having fun. Um, and Outside Magazine just had a, a release of an article called The Outdoor Industry's Problem with Millennials, their millennial problem. Uh, Scott McGuire was quoted in that, Janine Pesci from Range was quoted in that. Um, and it's really all about that we have a window of opportunity here to reach this new audience and that window will close. They will, if they get bored, they'll move on to something else if they're not um, drawn into this culture. And the culture is really not about death-defying summits of peaks. It's about just getting outside and having a good time and doing with friends. I mean, those are values that are important to this new generation of people. They like inclusivity, they like social, they like having fun, and they like sharing that with other people. And there's a lot of strategies and techniques that we can use to, to engage them authentically. Um, I have a sign-up sheet that I'll kind of pass around. If you want some of my kind of tips and strategies for that, sign up on there and I'll send you something after the conference. But um, it's, it is really about trying to engage these consumers that are doing it in a different way, but in a really accessible way that we should be able to rely on. Uh, Matt, I'm going to call you out. Do you, uh, do you have any numbers about why bouldering has expanded? It's, it seems much, much faster than trad climbing. It seems like there's that social aspect and maybe not so death-defying that's pretty... So for those that can't hear, what Matt said is that bouldering is kind of the bottom of that pyramid of climbing. It's the most social, it requires the least amount of it, uh, equipment to be able to get there. It's the easiest approach. And so when we start thinking about those sports, it's not always about what's at that very pinnacle. It's about those things that become really approachable. Uh, anyone have any other questions from the audience? So I'm, uh, I'm hit up almost daily from potential consumers who have a GoPro, a Squarespace site, who their claim is that they're going to give us a lot of good social, you know, content-driven media. How do you guys kind of weed through those claims to get, like, how, how do you decide who's legit and, and who's not? So the, qu the question is, I'll, I'll paraphrase your question, but, you know, everyone that today has a, a camera, a blog, they can write, they can video, and they're always looking for, they're always saying, you know, that we could do a better job telling your story than you, so give us some free stuff or pay us. How do you vet those people to really prove who's who's who? Oh, this is something I, think that's I a great deal question. with. Okay. I deal with this all the time. I get so many passionate kids that are so stoked on stuff, and like one of them will be amazing, the other one will fall flat. And it's a great question. Like, how do you weed out the ones that are actually going to get you valuable content that express your brand story? For me, it's always ramp up. You know, keep your expectations low. Get off of email. Get on the phone if you can to really understand their personality. Uh, look at their content, as I'm sure you do, and uh, see the quality of it. And then, you know, keep expectations really low. Throw them a hat or a shirt, see what they do with it. Throw them some more product, and then eventually, I mean, uh, Ben here, he's one of our main photographers of our company, and it started with an email that was just a couple pictures, and now we do full-fledged productions together all the time. So it's, I think it's creating a real relationship with people, uh, the ones that you connect with, you develop with, and then um, just let it authentically grow from there. I'm not a big fan of user-generated content. I don't want to pop, I don't want to, I know that's, that's an exciting buzzword, but you're expected to produce, in today's day and age, quality content. 
you're going to be judged, in my opinion, by the quality of your content, the consistency of your content and the quality of your content and the storytelling value of your content. Um, so much of the user-generated content that comes our way doesn't hit a standard that we've set for ourselves for the quality of, of, of the filmmaking, of the still photo, of the storytelling, of the uh, athleticism, um, of the authenticity. And we encourage it, but we don't necessarily, we let it be, today users have their own channels. So we like to see people distributing stuff they create through their own channels. Occasionally though, somebody will surprise us. So we have to be part of that filtration process, which takes a lot of time. And, and occasionally somebody, somebody comes through with something that's really cool. And that will make it up on Instagram. And a, on a rare occasion, somebody has actually turned into a, a great um, partner for us that's out there in the world, that loves what Arbor does, that is out there telling our story in their own words. But it gets down to such a few, few amount of people. It's tricky. And um, a, as a general rule, we, we, don't, we don't set ourselves up to rely on user-generated content because it would, be a, it would be too difficult for us to hit the standards and the volume. You need to do, you, unfortunately, you have to do a certain level of quantity to keep people coming back. And you have to definitely do a certain amount of quality to rise above the noise. And that is, if, that is a very difficult proposition and it really requires that you get serious about your own content creation. And you know, that's led us to be a, a production company. So, um, but these are your stark raving fans. So if you don't engage with them, if you don't send them, a, if you're not stoked, you don't send them a hat or shirt, you know, that, that's, that's so easy to do. Throw a shirt in, a, in, a, in, a, in an envelope and send it out to somebody who's just you're an opinion leader and clearly making an effort on your behalf. Um, if, if they feel rejected, they will move on or the worse, they will, they will be a negative component out there in the market for your brand. So um, I think it's a great question because it is a big challenge for every brand. We have created direct links to our consumers and they have direct links back to us. And if those go unanswered, if you don't have somebody answering questions on Facebook, if you don't have somebody answering questions on Instagram, if you don't have somebody answering your emails, your general email box, or answering the phones and calling people back who just thought they might reach somebody, I know those are old ways of communicating, you're doing yourself a disservice. It's worth investing in, but for me, we don't expect that to create a lot of real content for us. Yeah, and it's, it's overwhelming to try and control the social content that's out there that, that you don't create. What you can control is what you produce and hopefully you can approach some kind of brand ambassadors and give them easily shareable content, stuff that they can retweet, that they can repost, that they can share, educational materials, how-tos, stuff that is, is educational and tangible that people can quickly get to their friends. That's, that's really what, as a, as a company, you can do but the, you know, the social side is going to take it wherever it goes, and hopefully you just fed it the right materials. I do try to make a point on our social media to have at least probably about 15 to 20% of it be user-generated. It really stokes kids up. It makes them go from casual fans to like lifelong fans. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is get a picture that's nature-inspired or inspired by our brand and, and see it and understand it and then put our brand spin on it and it's kind of like having a conversation with it. They see their picture with our caption and they feel like they're part of the company. And in a very real way, these, these fans are part of the company. They make us who we are. And so uh, giving that back to them is super powerful. And you'll see them come into the store or smokehouse thereafter. And I mean, they just get so stoked. They show all their friends, they show their family members. And that's the kind of stuff that, that has really made our name and has allowed us to continue doing what we love to do for so long. We have time for one more question, if anyone has one. No? All right, thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you get you a chance to see out and venture out. That was cool.